Hey nerds, Farmer Jesse here. Welcome to Growers Daily, your daily dose of ecological farming insight. It is Wednesday, July 2nd, 2025, and today we're going to talk about prepping soil for heavy feeders, the wild world of rhizo sheaths, and sowing a crop into a standing cover crop. So let's do it. All right. Happy July 2nd, everyone. I hope everyone has uh, kicked off their July nicely and their week. Uh, it's just harvesting and packing and trying to get caught up around here. The cherry tomatoes have finally really started to kick on, so I'm excited about that, both for the kitchen and the customers. I have uh, a lot of affection for cherry tomatoes. They are an equally easy add to both salads or sauces. Plus, in terms of marketing them, they are prolific, fast into production and faster to pick. They People give them credit for uh, because unlike larger tomatoes that have to be gently picked and stacked into bins and, and thin layers, cherry tomatoes have a little more integrity and can be quickly packed a few inches high into a bin. Anyway, this episode is not going to be an ode to the cherry tomato, but sometimes uh, those little odes just happen. All right. I know it is Wednesday, but no interview today. Instead, we're going to get really nerdy and talk about one of my favorite soil quirks. So last week I did that segment about how to tell if the soil was healthy without tests and all that good stuff. And one term I threw in there kind of towards the end that I wanted to expand on, especially uh, as we head into drier weather, presumably it's the summertime, uh, is the rhizo sheath. Now I'll describe what these look like for a second, uh, but why would you be interested in this at all? Although it could point to a lack of moisture in your soil, uh, these root sheaths or rhizo sheaths, as they are sometimes called, uh, suggest that your soil has the uh, microbial populations it needs to help plants survive stressful times, like a lack of moisture. Uh, in other words, it's a good sign. Now, it doesn't occur on every crop, but folks watching on YouTube will be able to see it. Uh, but what it looks like, if you're not watching on YouTube, if you're one of our uh, growing population of listening folks, is that when you pull a specific selection of crops, like beets or in this case, uh, you can see that the roots are covered in a thick sheath, a thick coating of soil. It looks a bit like dreadlocks and is often called dreadlocks, but is really a collection of soil aggregates and particles somewhat affixed to the roots around the plant uh, by microbes and their enzymes and fungi, etc. Wait, you might ask, aren't all roots in the soil covered with soil? Uh, well, yes and no. The sheaths are a specific phenomenon that requires the right populations and varieties of microbes to occur. So in dry soil, if the soil was less healthy, when you pulled that beet plant out or whatever it is, uh, the roots would be relatively clean and white or the soil uh, could be easily shaken off. In the rhizosheath soil, in the healthy soil, they are thick with soil particles that are firmly attached. Like I said, this doesn't occur on every species, but are generally associated with legumes, uh, grains like wheat, corn, etc., uh, millet, another one, and uh, several others, and apparently beets. And those sheaths are definitely something you want to see on your plant roots, on those particular crops, in dry farming situations or in drier conditions. Where I find the most, in fact, on our farm is uh, grass weeds in our tunnel, where I may not have irrigation, like near the uh, pathways. In that case, the rhizosheaths are helping the grasses, admittedly somewhat to my dismay and annoyance, uh, survive those drier conditions in the tunnel. Through soil aggregation, the rhizosheaths help to maintain water uh, better around the roots of plants, acting like a little bit of like a microbial sponge or reservoir around the uh, roots, which enables the soil to better store and distribute water. There's also a lovely relationship between the environment of the rhizosheath and things like rhizobacteria in that it helps create a condition more suitable to nitrogen fixation and the solubilization of things like phosphorus. Uh, the nitrogen fixation one is actually pretty interesting because we tend to think of crops like legumes creating little root nodules where uh, rhizobacteria reside because it forms a, a, an environment where the microbes can control the amount of oxygen around them. A similar thing can actually happen in that rhizosheath, enabling the microbes to better fix nitrogen in exchange for root exudates from the plant, those sweet, sweet carbohydrates created through photosynthesis. And studies show significant differences in nutrient availability around the rhizosheaths compared to the other soils. Also, there are a lot of different uh, environments created within the rhizosheath, which means that it is suitable for a number of different and uh, complex microbial populations. And on that nutrient availability side of things, uh, quoting one paper on rhizosheaths, 
quote, statistical results showed that on average, the contents of available nitrogen, available phosphorus, and available potassium were 30%, 12%, and 27% higher in rhizosheath soil than in other soils, respectively, end quote. So yeah, they are great for plant available nutrients. Rhizosheaths also help to protect the plant from pathogens, uh, improve soil structure, provide habitat for various microbes, moderate pH, and build soil organic matter, among many other benefits. In effect, if you are seeing rhizosheaths on those crops that I mentioned, that's a good thing. That means you are uh, doing things right. If you are not, however, that can be okay too. Uh, remember, they are most prevalent and at least most visible in drought situations or in dry farming and only on that select group of crops. Uh, so they may not be obvious or thick in your context. If your soil is showing those other signs we discussed last week, then you're still good to go, uh, if not finding the rhizosheaths. Keep working on the soil health, compost, cover crops, low disturbance, all those things, and keep an eye out for these fascinating clues hugging your uh, uh, plant roots. Yeah, the soil will hug your roots when you're doing it right. Anyway, I hope that was fun. Uh, let me know what I missed or what I overlooked, soil nerds. One general note that trying to keep these topics from getting so nerdy it's not fun to listen to is a perennial challenge, so always feel free to add more nerdy details in the comment section, especially if I miss something or get something wrong or whatever. Otherwise, uh, let's hear from some of you and take a quick break after that before talking soil prep for heavy feeders. BRB. Hi, my name's Sarah Mast. We are in far west Maryland and our growing season has been extremely wet and soggy and everything is running probably close to a month late this year but we're still gonna get food we're still gonna be all right Today's episode is brought to you by Farmhand. If you're listening to this, you probably found five rare minutes to breathe. But what got pushed back further down the to-do list to make that happen? If it's your CSA newsletter, you're not alone. Farmhand's new newsletter builder was made for busy farmers. It automates weekly emails, drives add-on sales, and makes it easy to keep your customers in the loop without spending hours behind a screen. It launches this summer, but our listeners can request early access now. Visit farmhand.partners slash no-till. That's farmhand.partners slash no-till. All right, back to the show. If you, the listener, are enjoying this podcast, getting even a small amount of value from it, consider supporting our work over at patreon.com slash no-till growers. I will try to get to questions from everywhere the questions come in, but I will always get to your Patreon questions. Now, today's Patreon question comes from Patreon member Shane Hope, who writes, quote, hello, Jesse, I am looking to plant some sweet corn next season. The location is a field now. Soil is clay with some topsoil. I rent a tiller to open up the ground. I'm thinking cover crops like tiller radish and peas until winter. I'm doing my best to make compost. I do have chickens so that helps and we heat with a wood stove so we have ash i have two dead stumps to get out of the way is this a good course to prep for next year's corn garden i know i will need more nitrogen in the spring end quote uh, all right thanks shane uh thanks for these questions and i'm jealous of anyone who gets to spend an entire year prepping for a crop like this that's awesome uh now your question is specifically about sweet corn but i thought i would expand that out to uh include basically any heavy feeder like that because it would really be the same uh, thing for tomatoes broccoli peppers and so on. Now, what a lot of folks uh, do is that they don't start thinking about their garden plan until the spring that they have planned to plant. So you are already well ahead of the game here and your production next year will thank you for it. So for starters, I don't know where you're located, which will have some say in what you grow uh, this summer for prepping it for next year, then again over the winter, uh, assuming you are wanting to grow something over the winter here. Some very cold regions don't allow for much in the way of like cover cropping, for instance, over the winter. So that could be a factor. Anyway, you need something to help break up the compaction over the summer. And I wouldn't say the answer is tillage radish. That is a better fall slash winter crop. Instead, I might suggest something like millet and uh, sorghum Sudan grass over the summer. Run the chickens over top of that while it's still relatively young, arbitrarily six to 10 inches tall-ish uh, to fertilize it. Running chickens over bare ground is okay, but having plants there already ready to receive the uh, rich manure is a good way to keep that nitrogen where you put it. Effectively, you turn it in immediately into plant matter uh, that will later be recycled into the soil. Anyway, sow some uh, summer cover crop and then follow that with a winter killed cover crop mix like peas and oats planted about three to four weeks before your last 
against frost, depending on how fast it warms up there, how cold or snow packed it gets, and how slash if you are able to terminate it, you could also consider just growing a winter hardy cover crop like rye and vetch, uh, which will survive our winters here in zone 6B, Kentucky. And then we will just kill it in May and then plant summer crops into it by like June. Uh, when we had chickens, we would often run chickens over those types of cover crops in late winter as well, like over the rye, uh, before they really get to take off uh, to give them a little extra nitrogen boost. Now, winter hardy cover crops that are not ready to plant until June might be too late for what you're thinking. Or possibly you could do a succession of sweet corn, one planted into a winter killed cover crop, and then another planted into winter hardy cover crops like a month later. Again, much of this will depend on your season and growing climate and goals. Uh, anyway, I think you have the right idea here, Shane. Also, if you can, consider doing a little broad forking if possible before planting the cover crop to break up that clay just a little bit. Also, removing those stumps uh, will likewise leave craters in their wake. So be prepared to either have to fill those with something like, uh, I don't know, some good fill dirt, preferably from a trusted non-contaminated source, preferably from your own farm, dig a pond, fill it with dirt, whatever. Um, and then you allow that to settle for a little bit. The production on those areas will likely be different from the rest of the bed, at least for a time, uh, but maybe for a long time. So just something to keep in mind. Anyway, I hope that was helpful. We're going to hear a couple more clips from you all from our project from last week. And when we come back, uh, seeding over top of a cover crop before you kill it, not with sweet corn seed though, that that's too expensive to risk. Where is it? No, it is. Anyway, be right back. Here's our pollinator garden right here next to our dahlia patch. Horse riding rink that's been reclaimed by having goats graze on it, cover crop crops planted, and then raising out meat birds. Cut flower garden on permanent raised beds and compost. We are in Dunkirk, Maryland, Calvert County. I'm Jonathan, I'm a home gardener just outside of Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Overall, gardening season has been really good. All right, so I'm a bit behind on Patreon questions, so I'm taking an extra one today. This one from Meredith Light from Granite Springs Farm, who writes, quote, we practice thoughtful tillage on almost three acres of our outside plots. Sometimes I'd like to do back-to-back -back cover crops without using tillage. I don't have access to a no-till drill, and usually the area I want to sow is too large to rake aside debris and seed by hand or with the jang. Do you have any experience with sowing into a standing cover crop and then mowing at the appropriate time to kill the existing cover crop, letting the mowed cover crop fall onto the newly sowed cover crop? And then maybe tarp for a bit? I've played with this some but haven't had good results. I'd love to hear your ideas for back-to-back -back sowings. Meredith Light, Granite Springs Farm, Zone 8A, Central North Carolina, end quote. Uh, great question, Meredith. Uh, I, I love this. The idea of back-to-back -back cover crops is like one of my favorite things when you can do it. All right, so basically, if I have a standing cover crop, can I sow something into it, mow the cover crop down, and then let the other cover crop pop through? And the answer is maybe, but probably with a higher probability if you crimp it rather than mow it. Now, I should say I've never had great success with this mowing or crimping, but I've also never really tried it in earnest in a way that would have been like a cover crop going into a really, really hard cover crop. Usually if I'm following a cover crop, I'm following like a winter killed cover crop or I'm sowing it after it has been crimped for a while, something like uh, crimson clover. I usually just have a cover crop spot if I'm gonna try it that I don't really need anytime soon. I'll broadcast something easy uh, to kill like buckwheat into it, smash it down and see what happens. And usually what happens is that I get some buckwheat to poke through, but mostly have to deal with germinating buckwheat in those beds for a couple years afterwards. So not always the best idea. Uh, mowing, if it's a thick cover crop, leaves a pretty thick layer too. It doesn't last for that long, but at least for the first uh, you know, few warm weeks, the soil is completely covered. So most crops will struggle to sneak through those that that mulch residue. However, my lack of success with it is by and large less to do with your idea not working than the execution on my end. In other words, half attempts yield half results just kind of the way it works. It can, however, be done to some extent sowing into a cover crop. My friend Susanna Lane of Salamander Springs in Berea, Kentucky, will smash down a cover crop every season after broadcasting her dry beans into it and yield lovely results. She gets a good stand of beans after that. Also, as you mentioned, people using seed drills will smash and then sow or smash and sow at the same time whatever crop they want to plant to good results, usually on a larger scale. Beyond getting one of those push seeders that come out of Africa that like drill right into thick residue, what I think it would take to have an 
effective shot at making it work where you broadcast seed into a cover crop stand before you smash it uh, is a few things. One, the seed should at very least be primed. It needs to germinate and grow pretty fast, uh, faster than anything else that might be around it, like other weed seeds. If you can prime it, soak it overnight, preferably in a compost extract, then keep the area moist after sowing, well, irrigation potentially, or maybe hopefully rain. Uh, I think that will help get good germination. Also, you would want to sow it thicker than other stands because, well, the cover crop is a mulch, so it will likely uh, mulch out some of the crop coming through. And in fact, if it's a particularly tall and thick stand of cover crop, it won't be worth the seed cost, in my opinion, because of the mulching effect. However, if it's something more tender, like peas and lacy phacelia, and maybe even some oats, it could still work. Maybe, uh, like I mentioned, crimson clover. Of course, the beds would have to be very clean before the cover crop went into the existing cover crop, you know, just to can even consider this because there will be very limited options for weeding once it comes up. The cover crop would likewise need to be killed dead, as they say. You would absolutely need to render it terminated so it doesn't uh, compete with your crop. Generally speaking, though, there are not many scenarios where I think it's going to be entirely worth it to broadcast seeds into a standing cover crop without, like you said, raking the material off. If you're not planting like a cash crop or something you want to play around with it i don't see any major issues with that it's a fun idea and if all things go wrong it sounds like you have a tarp that you could just tarp whatever comes up that is in your way but to me it's perhaps easier and perhaps safer to kill the cover crop first uh, possibly with the tarp to help prevent other weeds from coming through and then go forward with the planting in whatever way makes sense for that crop which may mean raking off the residue anyway maybe there are others who have experience with uh, something like that and they would like to share let us know otherwise uh, are we done here wednesday yeah i think so don't forget, No-Till Growers is now officially a 501c3 nonprofit, so donations are tax-deductible and greatly appreciated. Please make sure to like and subscribe and or follow wherever you're getting this podcast. That's an easy way to help us out. Enormous thank you to all of our show sponsors, and if you'd ever like to sponsor the show, you can reach out to Farmer Michelle at notillgrowers.com. Huge shouts to Willie Breeding for the theme music, Mike Hilbert for the production help and editing, and the team at No-Till Growers. Also, shouts to Epidemic Sound for the background music that you can hear. Mama. Pick up a copy of my book, The Living Soil Handbook, at notillgrowers.com to support our work, also available in French, Italian, and German in those respective countries. Big, big thank you to everyone over at patreon.com slash notillgrowers, where at a certain level, or if you just bump up from one level to another, or you sign up in the month of July, you get a shout on the show. So big shout outs today to some new members, Matthew Snyder and Brianna. Shouts to you all and shouts to getting to continue our story. All right, so uh, when our flower farmer starts to walk down the path into the woods following the footprints of an unknown suspect in the flower burning fiasco, as they've decided to call it, um, seeing little bits and pieces of the flowers dropped along the pathway. From the town, our flower farmer can hear the sounds of the of a local festival they put on every year, uh, you know, like singing, uh, dancing, and cheers, and until suddenly, while she's walking down this pathway, all of that sound just stops. All of it, all at once, just disappears. So she runs down to the town, uh, you know, along the path, seeing the flowers still strung about in every which way, and as she gets closer, she sees the entire town, like all in the town square, fast asleep on the ground and realizes that someone must have stolen all the flowers to put everyone in town to sleep. Why? Well, that is for tomorrow on the Flower Hour. Mm, yeah, mm, yeah, it's all right. We'll stick to it. Thanks for watching and or listening. We will see you then. Bye.